here at the University of New South Wales. In this talk on the history of mathematics, we're going to look at combinatorics, which is a subject, although that has its roots in counting kinds of questions that go back a long ways, it really developed as a major branch of mathematics only relatively recently in the 20th century. So 20th century mathematics has some star performers. And in my view, the star performers are linear algebra, probability and statistics, and combinatorics. So our star performers. These are really subjects that took off in a, in a big way. Evidence for that is in the way they've um, become a very important part of the standard undergraduate curriculum. So we're going to talk about combinatorics today and some of the key 20th century people who contributed to this are Paul Ernish, Giancarlo Rota, and Richard Stanley at MIT. Okay, so the origins of the subject, of course, go back to almost recreational kinds of problems, but also other problems that come up in other kinds of mathematics. So typically, we have counting and arrangement kinds of questions, where we're looking at certain patterns and asking how many ways can we do such and such. Another important motivator and ingredient of the subject is graph theory, which has grown enormously over the last few hundred years. And there's also sort of the meat of algebra and analysis meeting in, well, power series or in combinatorics, generating functions. So these are all three important kinds of motivating aspects of the subject. And I wanted to illustrate some of the history by having a look at particular problems so we can see the kinds of uh, questions that people were interested in solving. So the first kind of question that goes back a uh, long ways, essentially to the 1300s and uh, Levi Van Gershon, The question is, how many ways to choose k objects from n objects? A fundamental kind of counting question. And the answer, as we all know, is given by the binomial coefficients. So n choose k, which is n factorial over k factorial n minus k factorial. That's the number of ways of choosing k objects from n objects. It's a binomial coefficient. And this, of course, intimately connected with what's undoubtedly one of the fundamental facts of algebra, which is the binomial theorem. So probably one of the really key accounting problems that is at the core of both algebra and combinatorics. Another question that goes back a uh, long ways, also to the 1200s and Fibonacci, is a question that's motivated by the population growth of rabbits. So we have a sequence, the Fibonacci sequence, 
which is 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, and so on. So this sequence is determined by the conditions that S0 is 1, S1 is 1, and then after that, Sn plus 2 equals Sn plus 1 plus Sn for n, I guess, bigger than or equal to 0. So this is an example of a recursive formula, a recursively defined sequence. A natural question is how to describe the nth term. How do you find S sub 100? So how to find, say, Sn explicitly? Well, the answer was given by de Morvre around 1730. And it was one of the first uses of the idea of a generating function. So it's a very interesting uh, approach to the problem that turned out to have a lot of ramifications later on. So what he did was he introduced a function, say f of x, which is like a polynomial, but it's an infinite polynomial, which encodes the various elements in the sequence as coefficients of powers of x. So we write 1 plus x plus 2x squared plus 3x cubed plus 5x to the fourth, and so on, where just the coefficients here are just obtained from the, the sequence. We think of this as a polynomial, an infinite polynomial that encapsulates the sequence all at once as one algebraic object. So what, uh, what he did was, well, he said, well, okay, let's look at uh, x times f of x. If we multiply the sequence by, by x, then the 1 times x is x. I'll write it here. The x times x is x squared. This 2x squared will become uh, 2x cubed, and then we'll get 3x to the fourth, and so on. And if we also multiply it by x squared, then we move over 2. So we'll have a single x squared, and then a x cubed, and then 2x uh, to the fourth, and then 3x to the fifth, and so on. And then he said, all right, what we can do now is we can manipulate things. We can take f of x minus x times f of x minus x squared f of x. So the first row minus the second row minus the third row. And then we'll get 1. And this minus this will be 0. And then this minus this minus this will be 0, x squared. And this minus this minus this will also be 0, x cubed. And in fact, this pattern of zeros will continue because of the recursive aspect of things. We know that the coefficient here is a sum of the previous two. So if we subtract two below it, we're going to get zero. So the result of doing this arithmetic is just a one over there. And then when we rewrite this by taking the common factor out, we get one over one minus x minus x squared, which is an explicit rational form for this generating function. And then it turns out that with a little bit of uh, analysis of this quadratic factor, if we look for the roots of uh, this equation, or say x squared plus x minus 1 equals 0, then the quadratic equation gives us um, minus b plus or minus square root b squared minus 4ac all over 2. And we're getting some golden ratios there. And then in terms of those golden ratios, we can rewrite this as a partial fraction and then use geometric series to actually find an explicit form for the, um, the nth term of this infinite polynomial or rational function. And so that's how we are able to get an explicit formula for the nth Fibonacci number. So the important thing, though, is this idea that we have a sequence and we can associate to that sequence a power series or generating function. So this thing is called a generating function. For the sequence, it's a very powerful idea. Another famous counting problem was 
asked by Euler. He asked, how many ways to triangulate triangulate an n-gon. So for example, if we have a triangle, well there's only one way. If we have a square, well there's either this way or this way, so there's two ways. And with a, a pentagon, there's a triangulation, and there's actually five of those, because this place where these things meet is one of the vertices. And if you have a hexagon, well, there's more ways. That's one of 14 possible ways. And it turns out we get there a nice uh, sequence, which carries on as next one is then 42, and then 132, 429, 1430, and so on. This sequence is called a Catalan sequence. And it's a remarkable combinatorial object. So in the online encyclopedia of integer sequences, so this is brainchild of Neil Sloan, so it's a lovely resource for people interested in combinatorial things. So the online encyclopedia of integer sequences is a tabulation of thousands of interesting sequences with all kinds of additional information about those sequences. And if you have a sequence of your own that you're interested in, you can go in there and type in your sequence and this will identify where your sequence is and tell you a lot about it. So in Sloan's online encyclopedia, this particular sequence is known as A000108 and it's a particularly important one because it has a lot of different manifestations. This is just only one of many different ways of arriving at it. And from a generating function point of view, it turns out that this sequence is also interesting because it's associated to the following uh, formula. That 1 minus square root 1 minus 4x over 2x. So this is in the sense of power series, where you think about expanding this using the binomial theorem of Isaac Newton which allows us to extend the binomial theorem to, say, power of one half. Then you can write this thing out as a series and you will get one plus x plus two x squared plus five x cubed plus 14 x to the fourth and so on. You are picking up exactly this Catalan uh, sequence. So that's also an interesting uh, thing to remember that when you have a square root uh, expression like this as a power series, the Catalan numbers may not be far away. Another interesting kind of question is related to partitions of n. So here we're asking how can we write a natural number n as a sum of other natural numbers. So x1 plus x2 up to say up to xk where the xi's, let's say, are decreasing, so x1 is the biggest one, is less, bigger than or equal to x2, bigger than or equal to, and so on, bigger than or equal to xk, and that uh, should be bigger than or equal to 1, so we want them all to be non-zero. We're interested in the number of ways of writing n in this way. So, for example, if we have 4, we can write 4 as 4, we can write it as 3 plus 1, we can write it as 2 plus 2, or as 2 plus 1 plus 1, or as 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1. So altogether there is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 ways of writing 4 as a sum of other natural numbers. And so the partition function p of 4 is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. There's an interesting, again, counting problem to try to understand this partition function. So this partition function, well, it looks like this. 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 15, 22, 30, 42, 56, 77, and so on. 
So the one we picked up there, there's P of 4, P of 3, P of 2, P of 1, P of 0, by convention is 1, and so on, P of 5, P of, 5, P of 6, and so on. So the natural question is how can we understand this uh, sequence? Is there any kind of pattern or way of predicting what P of some larger number is? So one of the people who made important progress on this question was again Euler who was a master at utilizing series to extract information from all kinds of different mathematics. And so he wrote, let's look at this sequence and consider the generating function for it. So p of 0 plus p of 1 times x plus p of 2 times x squared and p of 3 times x cubed and so on. So he realized that you could write this as an infinite product. So this capital Pi means product, so from k equals 1 to infinity, of 1 over 1 minus x to the k. So what's going on here is that if we look at when k is 1, we have 1 over 1 minus x, which of course is the geometric series, 1 plus x plus x squared plus x cubed, and so on. If we look at 1 over 1 minus x squared, we get correspondingly 1 plus x squared plus x to the 4th plus x to the 6th, and so on. And so this product up there is written out. It's 1 plus x plus x squared plus x cubed plus x to the 4th, and so on. And then the next one would be 1 plus x squared plus x to the 4th plus x to the 6th, and so on. And then the next one is 1 plus x cubed plus x to the 6th plus x to the 9th, and so on. And then it keeps going. There's an infinite number of additional terms corresponding to higher um, powers of x there. Now, if you look at uh, something like the coefficient of x to the fourth in this when you expand it all out. So if we think about the number of ways that we can get an x, x to the fourth out of multiplying these things, if you sort of look at all the possible ways, then you should be able to see that you're going to get five of them, and those five ways correspond to the different partitions of a four. Additionally, Euler had a look at this denominator that appears in this partition function expression. So we just look at the powers of 1 minus x times 1 minus x squared times 1 minus x cubed and so on, 1 minus x to the fourth. Then that turns out to be also of independent interest. So it turns out to be 1 minus x minus x squared plus x to the fifth minus x plus x to the 7th, minus x to the 12th, minus x to the 15th, plus x to the 22nd, plus or minus, carry on in some fashion. And Euler realized that these exponents here are generalized pentagonal numbers. Pentagonal numbers. They are sort of analogs of triangular numbers, where you arrange dots in pentagons of increasing size. And it turns out that you need to consider both positive and negative values of the size of the pentagon. And using these pentagonal numbers, and essentially this series, Euler discovered a remarkable recursive formula for the original partition function. Namely that p of n can be written as p of n minus 1 plus p of n minus 2 minus p of n minus 5 minus p of n minus 7 and so on. Where the expressions that are involved here in this recursion are coming from the exponents uh, in this uh, sequence. So this is a way of calculating a Pn if you know all the previous values of Pn. So it's a recursive uh, formula. It's a very uh, interesting and uh, useful one. That's called Euler's pentagonal number theorem. That's another uh, important study, study of these partition functions, and there are all kinds of other interesting aspects and identities associated 
uh, to these things. Another important aspect of the subject is graph theory, which also was essentially started by uh, Euler. He has his hand in almost everything here. So he was interested in a, a problem called the Königsberg bridge problem. And he concerns the geometry of a river that flows through the city of Königsberg. And the river does something like this. There's our river. And there are some bridges on this river. So there's bridge here, bridge here, 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 and here. So there are seven bridges altogether. And the happy citizens of Königsberg like to take walks. And on a Sunday, they would want to ask the question of whether they could walk in such a way so that they cross each of these bridges exactly once. So they don't have to duplicate going over a bridge. So Euler realized that, well, this problem could be sort of made a little bit more conceptual by labeling these land masses, one, two, three, four, and representing them by just dots. It's the essential information. And then the various bridges can be represented by arcs that connect various dots. So this bridge here is an arc from one to two, so we can represent it on the graph like this. And there's two such bridges, so we can put two arcs representing these two bridges. And then from two to four, there are also two bridges. From two to three, there's a bridge. From three to four, there's one. And from three to one, there's also one. So this is uh, really the first time a graph appeared as a kind of embodiment of the essential information of this topological or geographical situation. So the graph has nodes and it has edges. In this case, it has multiple edges between two nodes. And Euler realized that this problem of finding a walk that goes over every bridge at once is the same problem as finding a path along this graph that traces every edge exactly once. And he realized that the key issue here is what are the degrees of these vertices. So the degree is the number of edges that emanates from the vertex. Here the degree is 3, here the degree is 3, here we have a 5 coming in, degree 5, and here we have degree 3. And so Euler realized that an Euler path exists. In other words, a path where you go over every edge exactly once. So that happens precisely when all vertices, except for possibly two, have even degree. Basically because if you have a continuous path, if you walk into a vertex, you've got to leave it. And so the edges are sort of peeled off in pairs. And in this case, all of the vertices have odd degree, and so this thing has no Euler path. So the answer to the question is uh, no. There is no such, uh, no Euler path in Königsberg. Now later on, when graph theory became more developed, uh, there were, uh, of course, algebraic ways of thinking about this. So another way of thinking about this is to create a, a matrix that's labeled by the vertices, one, two, three, four, and one, two, three, four, that expresses how many edges are from one vertex to another. In this case, that adjacency matrix so we'll have the form 0, 2, 1, 0, 2, 0, 1, 2, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 2, 1, 0. So for example, this thing here tells us that from the vertex 1 to the vertex 2, there are two edges. So 
what we call the adjacency matrix of the graph and provides an important link from the graph theory to linear algebra. And we cannot mention the famous problem in graph theory, the four color problem, which arose in the latter half of the 19th century. And it is, can every planar map be colored with four colors? By this we mean, so can we arrange that we color the countries on a map so that neighboring countries have different colors? And we're assuming the map is planar so that it can be expressed or written down, drawn on a page. But in fact, the complete proof was only given in 1976 by Apple and Hawken. And this was a, actually a remarkable uh, proof because it relied very heavily on computer uh, aspects. So there was a lot of programming involved and there was a bit of controversy at the time as to whether this was allowed or not, whether we were going to allow computers to play a big role in mathematical proofs. Since then, other teams have investigated the argument, have cut down the argument a little bit, um, but they basically verified that what they did was correct. And so it's pretty well firmly established, but it still does require uh, some heavy use of computers. So it's a very interesting sort of modern development of connecting mathematics with the computer science. So I'd like to tell you about an interesting uh, direction in combinatorics, which uh, is intimately connected with the University of New South Wales. Uh, through uh, George Sekras, who was a professor here for uh, many years. He was also a collaborator and close friend with Paul Erdős. And the, uh, the first result in this direction is known as the erdős sekras theorem. It's a very a lovely result that really opens up a lot of new developments. So their theorem was that for a given natural number, little n, there exists a number capital N, which depends on little n, such that if n points are in the plane, no three collinear, then there are little n points forming a convex n-gon. So this arose from a simpler problem where you just start with five points so we have five points in the plane, and let's say no three of them are collinear, then we're looking for a convex quadrilateral. So these four points will not form a convex quadrilateral because convex means that if two points are in the interior, then the line segment is also in the interior. But if we hunt around here, then we can find uh, Say this one here, there's four points forming a convex quadrilateral, meaning that any two points inside the quadrilateral, if you take the line segment joining them, you're still in the quadrilateral all the way. This five point problem is called the happy ending problem because it was originally a problem that uh, George Sekeris and his wife to be, Esther Klein, uh, worked on together. There was some collaboration ultimately ended up in them getting married. Um, so the, the erdős sekeris theorem is a generalization of this, saying that if there is, um, we're looking for, say, a convex 5-gon, then there's a certain number of points in the plane. If we have those certain number of points, then we can be guaranteed that somewhere there's a convex 5-gon. So it turns out that F4 
is 5, so the number that you need for 4 points is uh, 5. F5 is 9. In order to get a convex, to ensure that you have a convex 5 gone, you need 9 points. F6 is uh, 17. And their conjecture is that f of n is 1 plus 2 to the n minus 2, suggested by these uh, values. But it's still an open question as to whether that's true uh, for all n. All right, so this kind of question where you're looking for a certain pattern in potentially a big set, and you're wondering whether it's possible that you can find some large number so that you're guaranteed of having such a pattern no matter what the actual configuration is. This was generalized in an important way by Ramsey, also around the time uh, 1920s, 1930s, and uh, like George Sekeris was also um, very close to having this kind of uh, theory. So let me tell you about Ramsey theory. So Ramsey theory concerns an aspect of set theory, or it can be also viewed as part of graph theory. And it's motivated by the following situation. Suppose we have five people in a room, and these people know each other. So do these, so do these, so do these, so do these. So these people know each other. Uh, but these two don't know each other, these two don't know each other, these two, these two, these two, they don't know each other. So if you stare at this, you will see that there is not a set. There is not a set of three people that all know each other. Or all don't know each other. But it turns out that if you have six people in a party, and some of them know each other and some of them don't, then you can always find, but with six people, we can always find a subset of three that all know each other. or all don't know each other. And we write this in this way, this is a Ramsey number. So if we want there to be either a group of three that all know each other or a group of three that all don't know each other, then the minimum number of people that we need to guarantee that either such a set or such a set will exist is six. So Ramsey showed that if P and Q are, say, bigger than or equal to two, then there is a number capital N, which depends on P and Q, such that um, if N people are at a party, there will be a set of size P, all who know each other, or a set of size Q, all who don't know each other. People have investigated a lot about how to find this capital N depending on values of P and Q. For relatively small values of P and Q, it's rather tricky. So um, 
n2 of 3, 4 turns out to be 9. n2 of 3, 5 turns out to be 14. n2 of 3, 6 is 18. And n2, 4, 4 is also 18. And we know n2 of 4, 5 is 25. But I think uh, we don't know much more than this as far as n2 of 5, 5 is concerned. It's somewhere between 43 and 49. And moreover, for n2, 6, 6, it's somewhere between 102 and 65. So this means, what does this mean? This means that if we're looking for how many people do we have to have in a room so that if there's some collection of people knowing each other and not knowing each other, that we can be guaranteed that we either know that there's five people who all know each other or there's five people who none of, each, none of them know each other. Then that number of people that we need in order to guarantee that is somewhere between 43 and 49, but where exactly it is, uh, we're not really sure. And this is a very tricky problem, and if you up these numbers not too much, you get questions which are very, very difficult. So interesting uh, combinatorial uh, kind of direction here with lots of open-ended questions. So the final question I want to uh, say a little bit about is this Kirkman schoolgirl problem, which also was a, originally a, a question that appeared in some popular magazine, recreational kind of mathematics. It was just a puzzle that uh, involved 15 girls and so each day they walk in groups of three. There's five groups of three each day. And the question is how to arrange the groups so that over seven days no two girls share a group more than once. So they each get at most one chance of talking with any one of their friends. Well, this is a, um, an interesting problem that really is closely related to certain uh, questions of design. There's a whole uh, area of combinatorics now that are interested in these sort of designs and, and, and patterns that can be created. Uh, so basically what we're looking for is a way of grouping them all the way up to uh, Saturday into groups. So for example, on the internet you can find solutions like this. So here are the groups. Okay, that would be the, mon the Sunday grouping, and then there'd be a corresponding Monday grouping and so on. And to actually explicitly write this thing out is uh, an interesting challenge. And it turns out that there's often connections with uh, geometry. With geometry. And these days, coding theory. in these kinds of problems. So this has been a selection, sort of some simple kind of motivational questions that have contributed to the development of combinatorics. But in the last hundred years, it's really gone in, in many different directions. So combinatorics has grown to uh, connect with a lot of different areas with certainly geometry, something called representation theory. It's actually a subject that uh, I've studied uh, quite a lot and there's a very beautiful and combinatorial aspect of it, sort of connected also with uh, Lie theory. And then with analysis these days, so certain areas of analysis which are moving closer and closer to uh, combinatorics. And of course with computer science, 
where this kind of concrete, combinatorial, finite uh, investigation is, is very important. And we've also mentioned uh, coding theory. And, uh, and algebra as well, including algebraic geometry. So combinatorics has really been a star performer and probably will continue to uh, grow very considerably uh, over time.